It's 4 or 2, so we'll start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Applied Development Economics series, um, hosted by the Lahore School of Economics, International Growth Center, and the Consortium for Development Policy Research. Today, we are very happy to be joined by Dr. Sultan Mahmood. Dr. Sultan Mahmood has a PhD in economics from the University of Paris. He is currently a postdoctoral research associate at AMU in France and will be joining the new economics school in Moscow as an assistant professor in economics um, next year. His research tries to understand the conditions for establishment of rule of law in societies and its consequences for international design and development. His papers have won best paper awards, for instance, from the Society for Institutional Organizational Economics. Um, he'll be presenting one of these award-winning papers uh, today. Um, so, Sultan, welcome. We're very uh, happy to have you here and we're looking forward to your presentation. Before we proceed, uh, some house rules. Sultan will speak for about 40 minutes. If you have any questions during the presentation, please post them in the Q&A function in Zoom. We will try to stop in between and answer any clarification questions then. We will also have a 15 minute Q&A session towards the end of the seminar when you can continue to post your questions in the Q&A. You can also use the raise hand function at this time to indicate that you have a question at which point we can unmute you and you can ask your question live. And with this, I'll request Sultan to start his presentation. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and Sultan, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and virtually albeit. And uh, next, like I was talking before with uh, Professor Navid, I would have I would like to be here in person. But now, like I am a LSE regular, I feel I, I presented already in person, and next year hopefully I can present some new work uh, as well. And um, Yes, so yeah, thank you very much. So this paper, we uh, have been we have been working on it for the last three years. Like I said, it doesn't mean it's great, but let's see what all of you think about it. Now, the motivation for this uh, behind this paper is the fact that religious leaders uh, have been long known to shape institutions, politics, and economic development. Just to give you two big examples, consider from the West the example of Pope Urban II. So I often struggle with this. If I'm telling, giving it to a Pakistani audience, I would have to tell you more about Pope Urban II. If I was telling to a Western audience, I would have to tell people more about Imam al Ghazali. But so Pope Urban II was the Khadim Hussein Rizvi of his time in 11th century France. And he basically was this charismatic leader who, who gave these sermons throughout France and throughout Rome to kind of start the Crusades. And people say that actually his, uh, his influence and his religious charisma, religious, his, so this religious leader had profound influence on future trajectories of nations. Coming from the West to the East, we have, uh, so you have in, uh, 11th century Persia, you had Imam al-Ghazali, who gave his notorious fatwa against science and rationality, where many scholars believe that his fatwa, which led to the banning of the printing press, led to profound influence on institutions and politics and long-run economic development of many Muslim societies. Now, religious leaders, are believed to influence institutions at least since enlightenment. Enlightenment scholars, especially Marx and Spinoza, blamed religion and religious leaders for really deteriorating religious leaders. And only now recently religious leaders, uh, scholars have begun to understand how exactly are these religious leaders influencing institutions. Now, despite this discussion, there is very limited systematic empirical evidence on how exactly are religious leaders influencing institutions, and in particular, how are religious leaders influencing rule of law in the courts? So in this paper, we ask the following two questions. First, we ask, how do historical religious institutions impact rule of law, and whether the effect of these historical religious institutions impact rule of law through rising of religious leaders to political power. Now, 
we do this in the context of Pakistan. And I think to just explain how I answer uh, the research question, I want to give you a bit of a background. Now, some of you may have recognized this mazar. This is the Bahauddin Zakriya shrine in the city of Multan. And who is the Sajada Nasheen or the religious leader or shrine leader associated with the Bahauddin Zakriya shrine? It is none other than Makhdoom Shah Jah Mahmood Qureshi. Now, what is it about this mazar and what is it about these shrines which, which, which have importance? The, the thing is that the, every shrine leader has a Sajada Nasheen or a Gaddi Nasheen. And these Gaddi Nasheens are believed to be the direct descendants of Prophet Muhammad of Islam. And what people, locals believe, that their sacred blood, their makhdoom blood, allows them to have supernatural powers, which, are able, which they are able to wield to heal the children, influence, uh, uh, and people come to them to resolve their social, spiritual problems. They come to get sons and whatnot, etc. So, they, so the point is that religious leaders like Gaddi Nasheen have a lot of influence within their community. They enjoy legitimacy in the community. Now, what we know is that Shah Mahmood Qureshi is also a politician. And we know he, right now, he is our foreign minister. Now, the question is, what happens when people like Shah Mahmood Qureshi rise to political power, irrespective of the political power? What happens to the courts? What happens to the rule of law when other people, the Gaddi machines, rise to political power? This is the key question uh, of this uh, paper. Now, to explain this further, I need to first present you my argument. So what is the arg what is my argument? So my argument uh, is as follows. So I consider, when I do this study, I consider a political equilibrium in Pakistan. And the way I see Pakistan's economy and politics and everything. Now, the, uh, uh, this, this is important when we frame our model. So throughout Pakistan's political history, local politics has been dominated, constituency level politics have been dominated by large land owning feudal politicians who uh, alternate power uh, at the local at the, and the provincial level, where they alternate power at the local and provincial level and where more federal level you have uh, the Pakistan military and the bureaucrats who, who run the show. Now, in 1999, like all other military coups in Pakistan, Pakistan transitioned from a hybrid democracy to a direct military dictatorship. And like all military dictators in 1999, General Musharraf disrupted the balance of power of traditional elites by introducing a local government reform. Now, this is important that every military dictator in Pakistan has always introduced a local government reform. And why, we explain why this is so. Now, in our theoretical model, we show that actually what this local government reform does is it brings these Sajada Nasheens, these religious leaders, to political power. And these religious leaders, when they come to political power, uh, they give legitimacy to the military. Now, the uh, military needs legitimacy and what this uh, uh, shrine leaders do is they, they take from military the power, a gift of power, and give them the legitimacy which they uh, enjoy in the community. So, so basically, these religious leaders which enjoy high legitimacy face, when they become, come to the dinner table of politics, they face smaller electoral costs and deteriorate rule of law much more then when a non-religious, non-shrine leaders comes to political power. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, in a nutshell, if I'm going to explain it to a Pakistani audience, my argument essentially is that when two politicians, so when people like Shah Mahmood Qureshi come to power, and when people like Jangeet Tareen come to power, both are in the ruling party, 
both are very strong um, they are wealthy landowners one is a one owns large cotton fields one owns large sugar fields and what uh, what my argument is saying is that in addition to the wealth religious leaders also have the legitimacy so shah mahmud qureshi relative to jangir tareen will be able to influence the courts much more than jangir tareen this is the main uh, uh, argument of uh, yeah uh, of of this paper so now just to give you uh, a brief uh, background of the theory uh, and the theoretical model so we have basically four agents we solve a general equilibrium model we have military maximizing its utility we have politicians maximizing their utility we have voters maximizing their utility subject to constraints and we even uh, and we have heterogeneous politicians shrine leaders and non shrine politicians maximizing their utility and we solve the political equilibrium in our model there are four ingredients first of all we assume that voters in shrine districts prefer to vote for politicians with religious credentials and legitimacy these religious politicians pay a smaller electoral costs for exerting influence on the judiciary relative to non religious leaders and now religious and non religious leaders decide whether or not to run for office and whether or not to influence the courts and judges also respond to the pol political pressure they respond by ruling in more uh, ruling in favor of the government more or or not what we do is we solve the nash equilibrium of the model and derive the endogenous structure of the political comp uh, political competition so a theoretical model gives us some predictions and we test those predictions and there are key empirical predictions which we test are as follows first of all we find that districts that have high historical shrine density those districts have more pro government rulings and lower quality judicial decisions so in places where there are a lot of these mazars those districts present day have lower uh quality judicial decisions and more pro government rulings and we show that this is entirely explained by the rise of the shrine leaders to political power now, of course this is shrine density and uh, uh rule of law is endogenous so our identification here relies on the timing of the military coup in 1999 where the milit the unanticipated military coup brings the shrine leaders to political power and what we do in a difference and differences framework we compare rule of law outcomes before and after the 1999 military coup across pakistani districts with higher and lower historical shrine density finally we also compute the economic costs what what these religious leaders uh, entail we compute that what these religious leaders do is they collude with the land mafias and expropriate land and we value that land and what we find is that religious leaders expropriate additional land worth 0.06 or 180 us dollar 180 million us dollars per year worth of land every single year so so it's not just that they influence courts they are able to expropriate valuable resources from the society which entails real economic Can I interrupt you at this point with Please some clarification question? So there are two questions by Maham Javed. So the first question is, do these religious factors facilitate these gaddi nishins in national politics, and how do they compete family competitions to achieve the status as well as political positions? And then our second question is, is there a difference in acquiring political position in competitions between shrine and non-shrine religious leaders? Okay. So thanks for this question. So. so the key here is so we are not saying that family uh, connections baradari military connections do not have any influence in the influencing courts the only thing we are saying is that if you have a shrine if you are a shrine leader in addition to your family connection you will have this additional superpower you have a potentially captive vote man who is who are going to vote to you you are going to influence the judges and you are going to say it's god's will that i did it and people are going to eat it up if a family politician comes in and 
gives this argument it's god's will people are not going to accept it as readily as it is so this is the main argument that you have this additional power of being a sajada nasheen which allows you to face lower electoral costs so this is what the model tells us that the sajada nasheen are, are going to face smaller electoral costs than what a non sajada nasheen would be centrist parables on family connections etc so uh, so this paper relates to several strands of literature and contributes to at least four strands of literature first it contributes the large literature on the importance of religion and political dynasties so now this literature has shown that leaders matter Real leaders matters for economic development leaders matter for political development of countries now uh in addition to just contributing to the literature on leaders we also contribute to this fundamental literature on what are the, uh, the literature that asks the following question that what are the conditions for establishment of rule of law in societies and we contribute to this literature by showing the political heterogeneity the availability of religious leaders and how this affects uh, rule of law thirdly we contribute to the growing and very vibrant literature on political economy of religion where where uh, the role of religious legitimacy uh, is deeply discussed and is very important finally and more broadly our paper contributes to the literature pioneered by nathan nan and temur quran where they show the long run consequences of culture and institutions on economics and politics and here uh we we contribute to this four uh strands of literature in four ways first we we contribute by showing that rule of law have deep roots what i mean by that is this shrines which were made long ago some of them are made in, in 13th century those shrines through their gaddi nasheen and religious leaders continue to influence present day rule of law outcomes in pakistan i show how this is explained by the rise of religious leaders to political power and we conduct this study in a large developing country pakistan uh, where uh, data is scarce as all of us might know and also where uh, democratic institutions are not very strong and studies are lacking now this is how i've organized uh, the presentation but if some if there is any question i would be more than happy to answer them um yes yeah, so there are a couple of questions one uh, this is an anonymous comment is asking how this would translate to businessmen mafias media and opinion makers would similar um mechanisms underlie how they influence politics as well um and then you know if you have time i can ask the others as well i just yeah so i'll just answer this so um so again the point here is that business mafia can also have influence on courts and everything family connections like was discussed on so what we are saying is that another important dimension of influencing rule of law is this legitimacy of this religious leaders now the kind of influence which business mafia and large land owners going to exert will be different from what uh but uh religious leaders can exert so i will come to this actually i will empirically test how different kinds of elite differentially affect rule of law so i i will actually even test this but for now what i what i would answer is that again the legitimacy of religious leader is quite different from a business mafia leader business mafia leader would exert his influence on the judiciary by running shaming campaigns of the judges for example but it cannot if it in, if it comes out it cannot influence it cannot say it's god's will this is the main thing so what and people are not going to accept it so the religious legitimacy element is what is highlighted in this paper so this paper is organized uh, as follows uh, i just so i will describe the data my empirical methodology my identification assumptions followed by my by the results and the mechanisms and in the end of course i will conclude but one thing i will not go into the 
in detail are many, many robustness checks which I did, which are relegated to the appendix. But of course, as, as we go along, if there is a question, I would be more than uh, happy to answer them on the robustness checks as we go along. So what is, so what is the key challenge of writing a paper like this? And the key challenge, of course, is the data. And the, and the key reason why this took more than three years is, of course, the data challenge which we, which we face. So the key outcome variables, rule of law outcome variables, are constructed from judgment texts. So these are decisions written down by judges. These are rulings coming out of the courts of Pakistan. Now, this is matched with Shrine's data from British Colonial Archive. So British Colonial Gazettes listed for every district, which was under the British Empire, the number, names of all the shrines in the district. And we use that to compute a measure of shrine density. Because British did not rule all of Pakistan, we also get some additional data to cover every district of Pakistan from Okaf Department of Provincial Ministry of Religious Affairs as well. Thirdly, to really distinguish between shrine leaders and non-shrine leaders, we also look at elections data. So we take this data from Election Commission of Pakistan and what is, uh, how, how do we distinguish between shrine leaders and non-shrine leaders? We look at the title, the honorific title which shrine leaders use, have, and that is makhdoom. So what we do is we basically compare all the makhdooms winning elections over time in different districts to distinguish between shrine leaders and non-shrine leaders. Finally, we also digitize three decades worth of census records to uh, add our control variables like population and population density, district level characteristics. So this might seem a bit vague. So I want to give you a concrete example of my data. So this is one example of my data point. So this is a case before uh, Justice Shahabuddin Ahmed and Dr. Uh, Justice uh, Khilji uh, Arif Hussain. Uh, this is a case by Khalid Mohsin against the government of Pakistan. The petitioner had claimed that he was uh, owner of some land and but the judge ruled is that actually, in fact, he's not owner of the land and the petition is dismissed. So this is, uh, this is the text of the judgment order which we use to construct our uh, outcome variable. In addition to our outcome variable, our explanatory variable on shrine density is constructed from the British colonial gazettes. So these are, these are examples of three of these gazettes. So this is from the Mia Valley district and in each of these gazettes, there is this section called fairs and festivals and in this section you have the list of all the shrines built in Pakistan. So essentially if we take a random sample of 7500 judicial cases from 1986 to 2016, this is 0.2% .2 of the a whole population of cases decided in this time period. These 7500 cases are decided by about 500 judges and these 500 judges are spread across the 16 divisional benches of the high courts all over Pakistan. So what we are able to do is we are able to cover every judicial district and shrines in every judicial district all across Pakistan. So we are able to say something about the whole universe of Pakistan. The key question is, I talked a lot about rule of law, but how do we, I measure rule of law? Now there is no single definition of rule of law in the literature. There is no consensus of what exactly is one golden measure of rule of law. So what we do is the following. We focus on all the cases where the citizen is poised against the state. And our key outcome or baseline, baseline variable is state wins. This is a dummy variable which takes the value of one if government obtains a victory and takes the value of zero if the citizen obtains a victory. Now, uh, what is the state here? The state is the local government, is the provincial government, and the federal government. So it's a citizen versus local government, federal government, and provincial government. Now, note that these are clearly the instances where politicians would have the highest stakes to influence the courts. And also this measure of the, this variable state means is exactly according to the conceptualization of state as an executive organ uh, in Montesquieu, L'Esprit de l'Ordre. Now, state wins is measured in two ways. 
first we ask a law firm to divide into two teams and independently code uh, state victory as one read the text of the judgment order co code state victories as one and state losses as zero and then we see across two independent teams we look at the correlation coefficient etc to understand the validity of both of these uh, coding in addition to that because but even even the law firm has expertise they might they are very subjective so to have a more objective measure of state wins we also do a textual analysis of our cases where we look for markers in the text of the judgment order where we look for markers such as petition against the state is dismissed if this is written in the text of the judgment order state victory variable will take the value of 1 if the text of the judgment order contains the marker petition against the state is accepted state victory variable will take the value of zero so we also look for different markers in the text of the judgment order to construct uh, to verify our state victory variable now in addition to state victories we also use two other variables first is the most commonly used literature uh, variable in the whole of literature and that is case delay now case delay is considered widely as a measure of bureaucratic efficiency so it is the time it takes for a case to be first filed and the time it takes for it to be decided from its filing time now case delay in most of the literature is considered as a measure of efficiency of the judicial system but i think in the pakistani context it might also be a measure of rule of law because there are a lot of legal scholars like dr sama sadiq etc who argue in their books that judges delay cases in pakistan to favor state authorities as well so delaying in cases is not just about inefficiency it's also about political influence so second our second variable measure uh, uh, is case delay additional additional use of case delay is it's very transparent it's very clear it's just the cn year minus filing year where we can uh, evaluate without any coding requirements our third uh, variable is decisions on evidence it's a dummy variable we take the value of one if the decision also which the law firm reads and whether the law firm decides whether the decision was on evidence of the case or whether it was on a legal technicality so this also gives us a quality measure of quality or rule of law so uh, so we will present our results for all three uh, variables so so our empirical methodology uses uh, our outcome variables of state wins as our baseline although we find same results across all three variables but i will discuss them as we come along uh, so we have a difference and differences framework where on the left hand side we have state wins at the case level on the right hand side you have the interaction term where you have the military coup in 1999 interacted with shrine density as recorded in the british colonial gazettes of 1911 but we do we add a lot of case characteristics as controls judge characteristics as controls district characteristics as controls we add district fix effects type fix effects and even case type fix effects kappa is our difference and differences estimator for the impact of shrine density on state victories and this is our main variable of interest will tell us how shrine density affects state victories after the coup but before i present to you the estimates of kappa i think it is very important to understand what are the identification assumptions which the causal interpretation of kappa rests on and that is where is my identification coming from so my identification is coming from the timing of the military coup here military coup was unexpected and unrelated to what happened in a specific district court military coup in 1999 happened because of a tussle between nawaz sharif and general musharraf and the military establishment it it had got it it had got nothing to do with what was happened happening in sakkar high this is the main identifying assumptions and what is the what are the implications which we can test from this identification assumption which come out of it is that what we as in any difference in differences we have to assume for this identification assumption to be true that there are no systematic differences in trends of state wins among high shrine density areas and low shrine density areas before the coup this is essentially the parallel trends assumption 
whether high shrine density areas and low shrine density areas before and after the coup they, they follow a common trend second and which and second identification assumption which is often ignored in difference and differences paper is this other identification assumption that is there is no time invariant heterogeneity uh, there is no time invariant heterogeneity that is there are not things are not changing which is also changing the military coup so for example there are no unobservable factors that temporally coincide with the military coup and differentially impact rule of law according to the uh, dynamics of specific district courts so now i present evidence in favor of both of these identification assumptions first let's do a very rough plot so this is not a formal or rigorous test which i will do shortly here we can see that if we just compare state victories where there are no shrines with state victories where at least there is one shrine in those districts where there are no shrines you see that after the coup there is a sudden jump in state victories relative to in those districts where there are no shrines the second thing which comes out of it is there seems to be some kind of common trend where before the coup you do, you see that uh, both high shrine uh, no shrine density Uh, districts and at least one shrine density districts are following a common trend so our counterfactual is at least a good one but this of course is not a formal test here we do a formal test of no prior trends where we find out when we do a formal test of no prior trends we find that before the coup there is no effect of shrine density on state victories but after the coup there is an effect the second key identification assumption which our difference and differences framework rests on is there are no contemporaneous factors which coincide with the military that is there are no confounding interactions with the coup consider the following possibility there is this military coup in the local courts people lose trust in institutions people don't file cases different types of cases starts getting filed in the courts this would confound our uh with uh confound our difference and differences result but notice that this systematic uh strategic filing of cases needs to rest rests on they have to be correlated with shrine density meaning that high shrine density people in high shrine density areas needs to file less cases than people in low shrine density areas before and after that here i present evidence that both types of cases filed and types of judges are similar before and after the coup so after the coup in high shrine density areas you have similar types of cases both filed and decided than before the coup so the intuition here is that as much as there will be difference in supreme court in local courts there is not huge change in case filings and different types of cases that show up in the case before and after the so this shows that you have uh, at least the obvious confounders are not support, not uh, driving our results so now i have presented evidence against prior trends and also in against confounding interactions with the coup i can more confidently show you my estimate of kappa which is which is as follows so when we estimate uh, our difference in differences equation what we find is that a one standard deviation increase in shrine density increases state wins by about 5 percentage points now this is substantial considering the fact that the mean of dependent variable is 50% meaning that uh, one standard deviation increase in shrine density increases state wins by about 10 percentage uh, over the mean so in addition to state wins we also find similar results for our other outcome variables and in particular our results on case delay and decision on merits what we find is that in high shrine density areas you just don't have high state victories you also have higher case delay and what we find is one standard deviation increase in shrine density increases case delay by about 2.5 months and now like we argued before increase in case delay can be interpreted as more bureaucratic inefficiency or it can also be interpreted as a deterioration of rule of law where judges delay cases as a way to favor state authority 
Thirdly, we also find that in high shrine density areas, you also have lower decisions on merits. In high shrine density areas, you have uh, you have uh, about six percentage points lower decisions on merits uh, relative to uh, relative to low shrine density areas. What this suggests is that you also have lower decisions on merits, more decisions on technicalities in high shrine density areas following the coup. Now, taking our results from state victories, case delay, and decision on merits, it paints a consistent picture that high shrine density areas following the coup deteriorated rule of law. Now, I, I have kept you hanging about the mechanisms. Why is shrines affecting rule of law? This is a critical, uh, critical question. Now, what I have reasoned is that the shrines, it's about shrine leaders. It's about religious leaders. So in my exploration of mechanisms, I will ask three main questions. First, is the effect of this historical shrine density explained by the rise of religious leaders to political power? Second, what are the types of government driving agencies? Meaning that in my case, the state was the local government, the federal government, and the provincial government. Can we disaggregate our different types of government and try to pin down how exactly are shrine leaders influencing the courts? And third question we ask is what are the types of cases driving the result? What are the types of cases in which shrine leaders gain favor? This, these are the three questions. So first, is the effect of shrine density explained by the rise of religious leaders to political power? To answer this question, first we need to uh, go back a bit his, of history. I, uh, some people must have read this uh, famous uh, book by Khurshid uh, Aziz, KK Aziz, on the study of Piri Muridi in Pakistan. And what this book argued is that religious leaders rise to power after military coups. Systematically, after every military coup, there are this rise of uh, shrine leaders to political power. So he presents about 20 and 30 case studies of all the famous religious leaders which became politicians only after the military coup. Now we basically provide empirical evidence of the argument which KK Aziz uh, put in his book. So where, here what we do is we basically look at number of maktooms and num number of Sayyids in election data who contested elections both before the military coup and after the military coup, and we see a dramatic jump in the number of religious leaders contesting elections and winning elections after, uh, after the military coup relative to before the military coup. Is this systematic? And the answer to this is yes. So to answer whether religious leaders to answer whether shrine density or historical shrine density is affecting rule of law through religious leaders, we run a triple differences. What we do is we show that when in districts where there are shrines and in districts where shrine elites win political election, a Maknum wins a political election, those districts have higher state wins. Whereas in districts which have shrines, after the coup where shrine leaders do not win elections, those districts have no effect on state victories. So what this shows is that the effect of shrine density is entirely driven by the effect of religious leaders uh, rising to political power. While also you notice we don't find any direct effect of shrine leaders, but we would affect if there is it's just land or if there is some other influence, we don't find any direct effect independent from the shrine or shrine leaders on state victories. Quantitatively, what we find is one standard deviation increase in shrine density increases state wins by about one percentage points when four more shrine leaders win elections. If we want to do this uh, a bit differently, if we just, we can also interpret this in a different way where we have shrine elite as our explanatory variable instead of uh, uh, shrine density interacted with the coup, we can have shrine elites effect on state victories where we can uh, instrument shrine elites by shrine density 
multiplied by coup. The idea here is that in districts where there are more shrines after the coup, those districts have more shrine elites elected. And what we find is indeed consistent with the different different results. Our two stage least squares have exactly the same results, where one more shrine leaders rising to political power increases state victories by one percentage point. So again, this this shows that when shrine leaders rise to political power, they influence the rule of law. Now, coming to the sorry. second question, what sorry, are the types about, of? Sorry, we have about five minutes left. Okay, I will. I will not go into the details of. Uh, so, I will. So, what are I will. Uh, yeah. So, I will go to the question of uh, what are the types of cases driving the results first, and these turn out to be cases involving land expropriation by the state. So, these are cases where. Uh, so, what. What the shrine leaders do is what we say is that they expropriate more land and collude with land mafias and expropriate land and influence the judges to give rulings in their favor. The same thing is in human rights writ petitions. Shrine leaders are able to influence the courts to uh, and get rulings in their favor in human rights or fundamental right cases. So these are the two key types of cases which are driving themselves. So, I have to explain it to a Western audience, what is a land case or what is a mafia case, but here I just quote Muhammad Hanif, you guys know him. So it's just a very simple, your house is my house, government and the courts can be positively hostile. What is a human rights case? Again, I have to explain it to a Western audience, what do we mean by that? It can be as extreme as just getting your citizenship canceled, et cetera, so well, and these things go in court. So this political salience channel that there is this political religious leaders use their political office to influence the courts is the key channel but we can run a placebo test and look at look in those cases which are not politically important for religious leaders consider the criminal cases which when we look for cases when the state versus the citizen we also have criminal cases showing up in our in our uh, data set so these are cases like vandalism, minor fraud, most of them are car theft. If somebody steals a car, whether he gets off or not, off or not that's nothing to do with shrine leaders' uh, influence. So shrine leaders does not need to influence whether somebody uh, steals a car or not. And here we find that <coughs> high shrine density areas after the coup has no effect on everyday criminal cases of theft, burglary, and minor fraud. Again, underpinning the fact that it is the effect is through the political influence channel. Now, finally, I think there is this one big step we also take in this paper is to answer how do religious leaders influence the courts. Now, historian, and now this will speak to many questions we got earlier on family, on business interests, on large land ownerships. And now historians have debated this for a long time that how do religious leaders influence politics and institutions? And there are three, basically two broad views. One is that it is the religious leaders are not just religious leaders. They are also very wealthy, large landowners. Think of Shah Mahmood Qureshi, which I began with. Shah Mahmood Qureshi is not just a shrine leader. He owns huge amounts of cotton fields and sugar fields all across uh, the South Punjab. So it's not just that he might not be using his uh, religious legitimacy, he, he might be just using his wealth and coercive power through the wealth. So this is the view which was first pioneered by Colson, then uh, reinforced by Gil Martin, and most recently also by KK Aziz, who, who argued that religion religious leaders are just large landowners. So it's just the effect of business mafia or land mafia. Second question, which is a more recent view and what for which I will present you evidence for that religious leaders are not just large landowners. They also have high legitimacy. And this high legitimacy allows them to get away with more than a secular leader. can. So this is this again, the example of but Shah Mahmood Qureshi can tell his constituency when he influences the judge, what Shah Mahmood Qureshi can tell his constituency is that this is God's will. But Jangir Khan Tareen 
might not be able to say the same. You will have to come up with a different story. So this is very challenging to really disentangle the two because religious leaders often come with also high wealth. So how do you disentangle them? What we do is basically we take a list from Ministry of Agriculture of Pakistan of cotton barons. Now they are not called cotton barons in Ministry of Agriculture. This is how I have named them. They are called progressive cotton farmers. So these are these progressive cotton farmers. Jangir Khan Tareen is one of them in, the, in our data set. And what we are saying is that what we see in, and then we match this progressive cotton farmers with our election database. We ask, like the same question we ask when shrine leaders uh, want political office. What happens when these la large landowners, these cotton barons win political office? And what we find is that this is completely uncorrelated with shrines, meaning that these leaders are not able to influence the courts as much as shrine leaders are, implying that it is something you just having large amount of land and wealth is not a sufficient condition to influence the courts. You also need religious legitimacy combined with your wealth, which will give you this extra push to influence the courts. So in conclusion, what I showed you was that districts with higher historical shrine density have higher statements, longer case delays, and lesser decision on evidence or merits of the case. And these results are entirely explained by rise of military leaders to political power after the military coup. We find no effect in districts where shrine leaders did not win elections. We find no effect in districts where no elections took place. We find no effect in cases which are not politically salient. And finally, using the text of the judgment order and the value of the land expropriated, we show that the economic value of additional land expropriated by religious leaders is about 0.06% of GDP. So the land expropriation that occurs entails real economic costs that, that has large costs to the society. So in the end, I would just conclude with K.K. Aziz's conclusion of his book on shrine leaders. But K.K. Aziz notes in his book on the study of Piri Muridi in Pakistan, he, his last line is, they came with religion but no land and left with land but no religion. I will leave you leave it at that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sultan. That was super interesting. And we have a number of questions in the Q&A. What I'll do is I'll just summarize some of the questions that have come in as anonymously. And then the others, I'll ask the, uh, you know, the, the participant members to ask themselves. So just one clarification question, which is anonymous, is that do you have any tables or figures that are showing how many shrine leaders do you have in both national and provincial assemblies, just, just out of curiosity, um, or if you have this plotted on a graph somewhere. And then next, I will try to unmute um, Mrs. Amatul Chaudhary if, um, if she can ask her question live. She's raised her hand. Okay, so Hello? regarding the first question on, so I don't, so the graph I showed you is basically, it adds, uh, this graph is basically adds provincial and national. So what I can do a disaggregation, but the effect is extremely similar. Both, actually it's larger at, at provincial assembly than federal assembly, which is interesting in its own self, but uh, the, the main point of, a large jump we see post-1999 military coup polls for both national and uh, provincial assemblies, although the effect is larger for the provincial assembly. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Huma Khalid. Huma, you're unmuted. Please ask your question. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sultan, you did a very uh, superb presentation and you did also very extensive research and you have explained how religious leaders impact rule of law. My concern is that what will happen if religious leader does not interfere law? Instead of interfering law, why can't they have both parties, the religious leaders and the law officials work on their own and in that way, everyone will work efficiently in their own field. So 
my concern is that okay, why, why should religious leader interpret the law? Okay, thanks for, uh, for this question. So the key idea here is that religious leaders, when they enjoy political power and religious legitimacy, they can get away with it. And that's why they interfere in, 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 in the courts and in the legal system. So the main idea is that because they don't face electoral costs. So if I, if I, I as a religious leader influence the courts, I'm going to get reelected anyways, once mm -hmm. I'm in politics, because my constituents are a kind of a captive vote bank who do not face the same electoral incentives, which, uh, which a secular leader would face. So this is the main reason why a religious leader would want to influence the courts. Yeah, I Thank think, you, uh, Mrs. Samatul, you're also unmuted if you can ask your question um, briefly because we're running out of time. Thank you. Okay, so I'll move on because we're short on time. We'll try with Mrs. Amatul again. Um, Kate, I'm going to unmute you. Kate Wyburnie had a couple of questions. If uh, Kate, you can please ask. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> nice yeah. to see you again, Sultan. And very, nice very interesting paper. Thanks a lot. Um, I had a couple of empirical things. I think you've partially on one of them. I, I felt like it would be useful to see a map of the shrine density variable because it seems like there could be a lot of things that are strongly spatially. And I think you've done so, you've shown some placebo tests which help to partially address this, but um, I guess it, it, it would just be nice to bit, know a bit more about how dealing with other things that could just be um, could be could be related to these uh, like a, a difference in difference effect for areas that happen to have a lot of shrines. Like, I think this is very strongly, you know, South Punjab thing more than say a North Punjab thing. Or it, it, it seems like it's got a strong spatial element. The other thing related to that would be thinking about robustness to spatial clustering or other kind of ways of clustering the standard errors to address the possibility of, of an effect there. Then the other thing is you were just talking a second ago in response to somebody else's question about electoral competition as being a mechanism for this, for the effects that you find. It seems like that's something you can test directly in the data or at least show descriptives on like, do these people actually face less, less electoral competition than, uh, than, ca than candidates in other areas of the country? It's not necessarily the only mechanism for them to have strength is through less, uh, less direct electoral competition. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Thanks uh, for this uh, question. Yeah, I'll just answer your second question first and then go to the first one. So yes, yeah, so this is uh, one thing you would do is you can do is you can exactly check re-election like Finan and et cetera, they do. And this is what we plan to do. But the only thing is that the power is low here because uh, the districts and the shrines are lower. So you have, uh, so but the jurists, let me be more clear. The jurisdictions of courts are lower. They are, they are very aggregated, so it's a divisional bench. There are a bunch of districts which come into uh, uh, ju different jurisdictions of the court. But setting aside that, so that's an interesting uh, point. But coming to your question of map of shrine density, maybe I was too fast on it. I did show a map of shrine density. Again, of course, it's a South Punjab effect, but actually, there are also a lot of shrines in the north of Pakistan, which not many people know. So of course, Multan is famous for its shrines, and South Punjab is famous, but there are a lot of shrines there too, which is an interesting uh, thing to see in the data. Now, coming to your question of whether the shrine density is correlated with other factors, of course, shrine density can be correlated with all sorts of factors, like historical commercial activity, distance to the river, many things. But this is why our identification through the military coup is so important where we are basically comparing shrine density in high and low shrine density areas before and after the coup. And our assumption is that in low shrine density areas and high shrine density areas are following similar trends. As a placebo, we do show that other characteristics like, like population density are similar. We show that types of cases filed are different, uh, are similar before and after the coup. Again, we don't, 
you can have a different trend and trajectory, but what we are saying is that the low shrine density areas and high shrine density areas follow similar trends over time, and that's what we are estimating. Yeah. How are you clustering the standard errors right now? So right now, uh, standard errors are clustered by district level, but we show the robustness of this result by wild bootstrap, by spatial clustering, which you suggested through Conley, Conley clustering as well. So, but as our baseline, we are going with the most conservative way by clustering by districts. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Tariq Rosa, who is also unmuted. Please, Tariq, if you can ask your question. Thank you, uh, Sultan. Very interesting talk. Uh, uh, Sultan, would you agree that the military establishment provides legitimacy to the religious leaders? We have see, seen it since 99. That's your case study too. So why blame the other elements of criminal justice system, like police, the prosecutors, and the courts? So how do you respond to that, the role of the military establishment? Is it being recorded? Yes. <laughs> joking, I'm joking. No, no, I'm joking. No, let me answer this. No, no. no, so let me answer this. Yeah. So, so the thing is, what is the source of you can consider? So, one thing we observe, and what many historians very rightly argue, in my opinion, is that these local religious leaders are pawns in the big game where the military actually brings them to power, but at the same time, this, of course, the big, bigger picture might be the military establishment, which brings them to power every time. But at the same time, when these religious leaders are given, uh, given political space, they continue to rule. Even when the military does not directly rule, Shah Mahmood Qureshi was first brought as a mayor of Multan by General Zia. He be, they, there was, after military coup, there was this local government elections, he became a mayor of Multan. Now, Zia left. There was sure. semi-democracy, but Shah Mahmood Qureshi stayed. And what I'm saying is that this can have long-term impact. Which So what military does can deteriorate institutions for the long run by bringing religious leaders which are unaccountable to political health. That's the main argument. But thanks for this question. Thank you. Um, while I'm waiting for the next person to unmute, just one question from Mohammed Ahmed Nazif um, from the Lahore School. He's asking if you've looked at heterogeneity by education levels and literacy levels, if that explains any of the voting patterns and the uh, results you find. So the, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a very interesting and important question. Uh, so I have not looked at it, but uh, my colleague, Rinchan Ali Mirza, I don't know if you know, know him, Rinchan Ali Mirza and Adil Malik have a very fine paper on the effect of shrines on, uh, on education. And they indeed find, so they use the exact same data set we have. So, it's ex so we even shared our data set to see that they are actually same or not, because we caught it and what we found is like actually a 98% match. So uh, Rinchan and Adil find that indeed, uh, areas which have more shrines, those areas are now have lower literacy. So, yeah, but they are historians. They exactly like Kate's point. It's like, of course, shrine densities are correlated with a lot of things. This is why you need a difference and differences identification here. But still, the evidence is consistent with them. And it's a fine piece of historical uh, research done by them. And they indeed find that actually it is the most relatively lower educated people who, who are the ones who, who are kept, who are a captive vote bank to the shrine. Thank you, Sultan. I know we are out of time, but if we can ask you to give us five more minutes, maybe we can get to the rest of the questions, if that's okay. We have a couple of more questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, next, we have Iftikhar Ahmed Rao, who's also unmuted. Iftikhar, if you can ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Um, Yes, I can yes. hear you. Okay. Uh, right. A very simple question. I am a layman sort of a person, doesn't know much about it, but uh, my two observations. One is um, you said the uh, dynasty, uh, Sharan dynasty, uh, 
vote bank has increased or number of uh, MNAs, M MPAs have increased. My understanding or what I know a little of about it is the uh, vote bank has increased, but they were never, uh, they never had a winning vote to have a majority in the assemblies, uh, whether in the national or the provincial assemblies. Uh, they do get uh, certain seats, which are pet seats to them, and they, those were there uh, even at the time of partition. And then uh, Mullah Military Alliance started, and then political leader also started uh, getting these religious votes. And they were using it like a Machiavellian uh, thing, uh, be religious if you want to uh, win the politics. That was my observation on that. But secondly, um, are these uh, Sharayan leaders or the mafias or the political leaders or the business businessmen or the military stopping us from doing things right? Why the government servants are not doing things right, right? Why can't they say, why can't they have a spine and say, no, sorry, this is wrong, I can't do it. Why do we blame uh, everything on uh, some mafia, some landlords, some military, some religious people? And thirdly, the religious divide was so much and is still so much after particularly the jihad, when uh, a particular brand of uh, Islam was uh, launched, and then um, the shrine leaders uh, um, are nothing in front of those uh, die-hard jihadis. So how do they affect uh, all our system and uh, criminal justice systems, the police, the uh, prosecution, the judiciary, and all that? I don't know. These three observations and a, sort of a question. Thank you for this question. So, uh, so what I'm saying is that so these are MPAs and MNAs which become shrine leaders. So I'm not saying that after the military coup, you have a shrine leaders party. What we are saying is that in all parties, you, you, get, you have shrine leaders invited to the dinner for, uh, table of politics. And the theoretical argument is as follows. Shrine leaders uh, can gain political influence. So it's their self-interest to, uh, to basically support the military and basically come to political power. At the same time, military free rides on the legitimacy of the shrine leader. So if, for example, Shah Mahmood Qureshi says his local constituent is going to say, okay, the military is not so bad because Shah Mahmood Qureshi is also supporting him. So this is the main idea. Now coming to your question, whether there can be any uh, reform and this kind of thing, my paper doesn't speak directly to any of this, but it does say is that many of the things which are wrong in developing countries in Pakistan, they are rooted in deep-rooted structural problems like historical shrine density, which have brought religious leaders to power through democratic, semi-democratic means where people vote for them, at least at the very local level. They might not vote for them completely, but at least you might have swing voters which always vote for them, or at least a, they might have a core base which vote for them. And this makes it difficult for reformers to change uh, rule of law because these leaders, the shrine leaders, relative to other leaders, face lesser electoral costs than uh, relatively secular leaders, and they can get away with influencing courts much more than others. That does not mean that this traditional leaders like, for example, Jagir Khan Tareen, they don't influence the courts. What I'm saying is that you might, you can, if Jagir Khan Tareen was a shrine leader, he would be able to influence the courts even more. That's the main idea. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sultan. We, I'll just ask one more question. This is the last question. We have more, but I think I'll just... Uh, perhaps send that to you and we can answer those offline. Um, we have Zunia Tirmizi from the Horse School of Economics. Zunia, if you can ask. Um, um, hello. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sultan. This was a very, um, very interesting presentation. So my question is um, regarding that, um, can you somehow account for religious leaders' own record of compliance with the rule of law and their accountability? And do you think that this will have an impact on how they can influence the rule of law. Thank you. Can you repeat, what do you mean by own, own compliance? Uh, like uh, their, their own record of uh, following or complying with the, with the rule of law. <clears throat> so again, so religious leaders, 
of course can comply with the rule of law but at the same time they at least what my paper shows that they at least have the ability and they have the they don't face a electoral cost relative to other leaders for not complying as well so it is just showing that in high shrine density areas those districts in those districts religious leaders do not need to comply uh, uh in uh, for the rule of law and what they do is that they are able to influence the state get more rulings in favor of the state are able to expropriate land and get away with it that's that's the main idea thanks <laughs> All right, thank you, Sultan. Uh, we've already taken up too much of your time. As I said, we do have more questions, um, which we will send to you, and perhaps we can have a discussion offline on it's them. It's great, thank and I, I'm very happy I got so many questions. It means that uh, people were not completely bored and found this interesting. Not at all. This was this yeah. was super interesting, and I think as we were discussing earlier, we don't get to see the, this kind of data, and so this is um, really exciting for us. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you also to the participants. I know a lot of people had to leave, but thanks all the same to everyone who attended today for their time. And we, uh, just to announce from next month onwards, we're moving to a fortnight, fortnightly schedule. So we'll have a seminar every other Tuesday. The next one is going to be on 13th October by Dr. Lee Crawford um, on contracting at schools in Pakistan. And I hope to see you all on the 13th of October. Thank you and take care. Thank you.